welcome to today's webinar. My name is Skylar Cunningham of Lean Frontiers and I will be hosting the webinar today. You can also see on the screen our presenter, Bob Melvin. Just a few points of logistics and before we get started, today's short presentation is being recorded. So look for an email shortly after this recording with a link to view the session on demand. Please share it with those in your organization. Due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be filling questions. If you do have questions, our presenter will share his email address and you can email the presenter directly. Today's webinar is a part of a series of webinars leading up to the LPPDE conference. Look for an email shortly after today's session for a link to the other webinars. With that being said, let me introduce our presenter, Bob Melvin. Bob is Vice President of Engineering at Teledyne Marine, board member of the Lean Product and Process Development Exchange and organizer of the Northeast Savvy Consortium. Since 2007, Bob has advanced Teledyne's Lean Product Development Process and Knowledge Library, including writing the book, Knowledge-Based Product Development, A Practical Guide. Bob considers himself a practical engineer, always looking for ways to improve himself and the company. So for now, I'll hand it over to Bob. Uh, thank you, Skyler. Uh, yes, Bob Melvin here, uh, VP of Engineering at Teledyne Marine, and also on the board of the LPPDE. And I'm excited to talk about injecting knowledge into innovation with you today. So what is innovation? And I like to go back to the Clayton Christensen model, who was a um, very well-known author and, uh, and, and worked at the, at the Harvard Business School, and unfortunately passed away recently. But I was, have always been just uh, enjoyed his uh, his views, took a course at Harvard Business School, and I've learned so much from him that I, I have to always um, basically uh, mention him in any of these presentations because a lot of this material are things that he has studied and researched over the years. So what is innovation? So sustaining innovation, that's what most of us do at established companies. We're really good at adding features and capabilities for our best customers. In fact, if you look at it, we are we're just constantly making more improvements and betterments, and and, it, and basically only the best customers who really understand all the different features and and needs. Uh, that's sort of it's continuously a continuous improvement, also the point where they have too many features. And if you look at Clayton Christensen's model, there are two types of disruption or innovation, and one is this low end disruption, which is where uh, where small startup companies would basically take on the incumbents by going in at a very lower price point and maybe less features, but just eke out that minimum performance level that a, that a, that a product needs in order for, a, for someone to, to want to purchase it. And then there's disruptive innovation, and that, this is what everybody is looking for. How do we generate a brand new market? Do a job that's never been done before, and by doing this, we're looking for non-consumers, people who are not purchasing a product to do this job today. And those customers want something that's easy to use. It's gotta be very simple, convenient, and of course, at a very low price. So let's talk about this a little bit more, is how it affects, how it uh, feeds into innovation. So to be successful in innovation, I say there are three things that you need to do. First, you need to be disruptive. Second, you need to fill a job to be done. And third, you need to nail it with a solution that works. So what is being disruptive? I touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail right now. So over time, the performance of a, of a product will improve. And that, that's, that is what happens with you know, continuous improvement, adding features, learning more about how, what customers need. So over time, products will improve. But for a customer to buy it for the first time, he has to, that product has to at least surpass some minimum performance level. So there you go, there's your, there's your line as you develop your new product and you slowly make uh, improvements all along the way. And at some point, as I said earlier, you'll get to the point where you have an excess of performance. And this is where only your best customers really need that excess of performance. And, and your product is really well-defined in the market and well-established. But what we're looking to do is be disruptive. What we want to do is we want to find a, a market that's adjacent to this where your product is not being used. And again, we have to go through that uh, basically 
pass, surpass this minimum level of performance, and we'll slowly work our way up until we actually have an excess of performance. But our goal here is to find a market where there are non-consumers. Somebody who needs something that maybe doesn't quite uh, need the performance of something that exists out there today, where we can break in and, and basically start a new, a, new, um, a new product. So let's talk about something very relevant to today. And that is face masks in this uh, COVID-19 coronavirus um, event. Of course, face masks have, have turned from something that was, you could say, a standard item in, in healthcare, right? With definitely uh, had performance that meets the needs for them. And also, if you go down to Home Depot or Lowe's, you can find yourself a face mask for uh, your woodworking. Again, met the performance. Uh, and those are something that are established, they're known, and, uh, and, they, and they work well. But what's happened is that now everybody's being asked to wear a face mask. And the set of criteria, this is, a, this is a people who are non-consumers of face masks today, and they also are people who don't probably need quite the, uh, the features of the other than face mask because it's, it's a different market. They need something simple. So... To go to number two, what is the job to be done? And when you look at this, you want to make sure you don't do it from the standpoint of sort of market segmentation. That's the old school way of doing it, uh, sort of just looking at data. What you want to do instead is really focus on why the customer is hiring that product to do that job. And a lot of jobs regularly ar arise that need to be done. And uh, we want to solve that problem. So look at it from the standpoint not of, of, of the market analysis and demographics. But what are we really trying to do with that job to be done? So if you look at the uh, face mask again, I went right to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control website, and they've got a great uh, description of what the job to be done here is. And if you look at the, the words here I've highlighted, they want people to start wearing a cloth face covering in public settings. So when you're speaking or you cough or sneeze, you basically cover your mouth so the virus can't, can't spread. That's the job to be done here. And it's a very simple one, but it's one that needs to be done. And it's something to help keep us all safe. So there's your job to be done. So the third thing we need to do is we need to look at finding a solution that, that nails it. In other words, we want to nail it the first time. If you look at, at what, uh, what is a lot of books are out there, they talk about agile. And those can also definitely help you to focus your efforts on what the most important needs of the customers are first. But second, uh, you know, if you look at some other books, they talk about how you could, if you guess it wrong, no problem. We'll just pivot and move on to another way of, of solving that problem. But my question for you is this, but do you have time to pivot? What if you could find a way to get to that root need of the customers and come up with a product that, that does the job the first time. No need to pivot, you get out into the market faster, and you start to build your, your market share and start to build profit for your business. So that's what we wanna do. So how does lean product development fit into this model? So the two basic principles of lean product development are understanding the knowledge of the true customer interest, and second, do we have the knowledge to design the product? So kind of looking back at the old way, people would just give us specifications as engineers. We'll do our best to meet them. We'll try it, we'll build it, or maybe we'll have to go back again and do it. But every time we do it, um, given enough time and money, we would eventually get to the product that the customer wants. But we don't want to spend that time and money. We want to get to the market first. And in an innovation, especially disruptive innovation, you need to be in that market the first time with a successful product that meets the needs of the customers. So, and also, I may throw in there, we definitely want to capture that knowledge. Somehow you have to capture that in an A3, a knowledge brief, get that knowledge captured because in the future, people are gonna look back and wonder, why did you make those decisions? So, what I like to, to do is use what Michael Kennedy came up with, which is the Lambda cycle. And so we want to really define that first principle was defining the customer interest. So the way to do that is to go around the Lambda cycle. You start with look, observe without any preconceptions of what the customer's requesting. What are they looking for? 
you want you don't want to come in and design it for them on a phone call. You want to look and, and basically observe and understand. Then ask. Use the five whys. It's very important to ask the five whys. Pull out of the customer why they need something. And just keep asking those five whys until you actually get to the root, uh, the root reason why that they, they need this product or they need this problem solved. Then model it. I like to say modeling is writing it down. Write your A3, write your K brief, you know, really get, that, get it down on paper. There's no confusion. Everybody understands what you're talking about. Everybody can look at your data. And then finally discuss it. So in your, in your company setting, pop up that A3 or the K brief on a, on a screen and talk about it. Really look at what the customer is, is doing and agree as a team whether you think you have enough information to proceed. If you don't, go back again. Go back and look and ask more questions. Update that K brief, that A3, and keep going until you really feel confident that you have it. That's very important. So remember, this is the first principle of lean product development, to find the customer interest. So what's our customer interest in face masks? Well, first of all, there'll be some metrics that people will use to decide whether you're getting the job done. Right? What are the, what are the things that the basically the key five to ten um, sort of metrics will somebody use to decide on what they want to buy for a face mask? So, and then uh, how are they going to judge whether you have value when they go and purchase that? So it's very important that you look now. Now here's an early face mask that um, that I tried out. It was a Brillo pad. Now I didn't know whether the Brillo should be on the inside or the outside, but I have to tell you, it just didn't meet my required metrics. So unfortunately, didn't last very long. But hey, you know, it's a learning experience. You got to try things, especially early on in the in the event. So what outcomes are unimportant and well satisfied are kind of overserved. In other words, but where we don't want to focus our energy there. Where we want to focus our energy is on the outcomes that are underserved. And if you notice here, I, I will tell you I had problems with this one because my glasses kept fogging up. So not only was it uncomfortable, but the fogging glasses was really causing me some issues. So that's one of the outcomes certainly was underserved. And by the way, probably comfort was pretty much underserved also. So let's talk about face mask metrics or outcomes. So here's a few I just came up with. How easy is it to put on? You know, I've got a couple of face masks right here next to me. You know, I've got this one that, uh, Kind of, I purchased a box of 50 or so of these. They go around your ears. You know, does it stay on my face? Uh, I, I tried a couple and they kept falling off. They, in other words, maybe this band was a little designed incorrectly, just didn't fit right. I've got another one. My, my wife made some of these. Uh, they were really well done. My daughter and my wife sewed these. And we tried putting these on. And then the question is, how many uh, folds of the material do we have? Do we need to make it work? How long do these bands to make it comfortable to wear as I write up there? Is it stylish? You know, she made these for me. My, my wife and daughter have ones with flowers on them. Do my glasses fog up when I'm wearing it? They, they still do, unfortunately. There was a, a little uh, piece of metal in here that was supposedly gonna go around my nose and, and, and stop it from, from fogging up. Didn't really work that well. And of course, another metric is, does it protect others from my germs? Because why are we wearing face masks? We're wearing face masks to make sure that we don't spread any germs, so we don't spread the, uh, the virus. And this one came with a little pocket that you could put a little, um, nice little um, filter in to try to spread the, and stop the spread of germs. So if you look at this from the disruptive innovation Clayton Christensen model, uh, you know, they're looking at non-consumers, that's us, people here, sort of normal people on the street. And we're looking at what are they most important, most, uh, most uh, interested in. In most of these cases, it'll be something that's a simple need, something that is not very complex, like a nurse who's working every day with patients who really needs to be protected. So for me, how well does it stay on, my, on your face and how stylish does it look? Probably more important than does it protect others from my germs, even though that is what it's really there for. So engineering knowledge, the second principle. Before you start designing a product, 
I, do you have the knowledge to ensure you're going to be successful? What are your knowledge gaps? Without understanding and eliminating those knowledge gaps, it'll be very difficult to find success the first time, which is our goal. So don't accept any specifications early on. Don't, don't, um, don't commit to any unrealistic deadlines until you are really positive that you have your knowledge gaps covered. So usually what I do with a knowledge gap analysis is we break down the product into its different subsystems. You know, we got, we've got material, we've got a mass, we've got some bands, we've got the subsystems. We talk about each one of these. Talk about how we're going to manufacture them. What kind of environment are they going to be in? How is the customer using this? Are they hanging it on the mirror in their car? How are they doing this? How's it going to change over time? All these decisions have to be discussed to really be successful the first time. And then once you have all of those decisions and knowledge gaps, you need to test before you design. So let's look at the face gap mask knowledge gaps. You know, as I said, the material, is it breathable? Is it comfortable? Uh, how am I going to attach it? Am I going to go around the ears, tie behind the head? Is it going to be pull up like a uh, bandana? And of course, the style and print and the logo, very important. So we want to get all of these right the first time. So, and that's what's critical. And so that's why sort of in summary, I wanted to say that uh, the whole idea of innovation and injecting knowledge in the innovation is what's going to make you successful as a company, especially in a startup and especially when you're trying to get at something that is a disruptive innovation. So first, be disruptive. Make sure that that is going to be a product and a market that people have um, non-consumption is happening and, and where you can actually go in with a very simple product and, and meet that needs of that job to be done. What is the job? Write it down. Write down in two or three sentences what you need that job to be done. Very easy for me. Took it from the CDC website. And then nail it with a solution that works. So go through all these. Find a comfortable material. Try it out. See which solution fits behind the ear. If you can find a solution that doesn't fog my glasses up, email it to me immediately. So follow all these principles of lean product development in your assured success. So thank you. I want to thank Skyla. I want to thank Lean Frontiers for a chance to give you a little teaser of what I like to talk about when it comes to disruptive innovation and how lean engineering principles fit into that to actually come up with a successful product the first time so you can get into that market and, and make your uh, company grow. So Scott. I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you for facilitating today, Bob. As mentioned earlier, you will receive an email shortly with a link to the recording. Please share this with those who might find this information useful. Thanks again, Bob, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a great day.